Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, I'm very pleased to be bringing you two activist interviews on breaking news. First, we talk with Laverne Trayan, who has been working against the Fort Calhoun nuclear reactor near Omaha, Nebraska, since the 1980s. We'll be catching up with him less than one hour after that Entergy-run nuke had been shut down for good. Then we revisit Diane Turco of Cape Downwinders in Massachusetts about last week's State House speakout against allowing the Pilgrim nuclear power plant, according to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, one of the worst-run reactors in the country, to continue operation. Things are heating up in New England, and Diane Turco will tell us all about it. Plus, numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness. The nuclear reactor duck and cover report on what's gone wrong this week with those aging rust buckets, and more honest nuclear information than even NPR programs seem to be able to get on air. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, October 25, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. Starting off in the United States, where the big news is that the nation's smallest nuclear power facility permanently shut down on Monday, October 24th. The Omaha Public Power District's board decided earlier this year that the Fort Calhoun nuclear power plant is no longer financially sustainable. But the shutdown is only one of the first steps of a decommissioning process that could stretch on for as many as 60 years and cost more than $1 billion. Fort Calhoun was licensed until 2033, but went offline 17 years earlier than planned. Now that local communities are facing the reality of life after the cushy years of nuclear power generation, they're being struck upside the metaphoric head with the reality of what it means to live with a nuke in your community. As one woman near Fort Calhoun said, it's not fair to the communities that get stuck with the dangers and financial burdens of nuclear waste without the high-paying jobs, reliable, I'll put that in quotes, but she said it, reliable electric power and tax benefits of a working nuclear plant. To anyone who has a nuclear reactor in your community, this is what you face. This is what all communities face. We'll go into the Fort Calhoun closure and what it means during the first of our two featured interviews on today's program. Here's one last financial factoid about the Fort Calhoun closure. Omaha Public Power District hired Exelon Generation, the Chicago-based nuclear operator, to manage day-to-day -day operations at Fort Calhoun beginning in September of 2012. They signed a 20-year contract, and in order to get out of it because of an early closure of the facility, OPPD has to pay Exelon $5 million. I wonder who negotiated that contract. In Boston, on Thursday, October 20th, anti-nuclear activists renewed their efforts to have the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth shut down immediately. They did so by staging a speak-out before delivering yet another letter to Governor Charlie Baker's office. Citing safety concerns, Cape Downwinders has called on Baker to pressure the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to immediately close Pilgrim, which is scheduled to close by May 31st of 2019. Ongoing safety issues at the plant were cited as the reason for pushing for the immediate closure, the most recent of these safety issues being an emergency shutdown of the reactor last month following a mechanical issue identified while preparing to put the main turbine generator in service. We will have much more on this story during the second of our two featured interviews today. 
in New York, backlash has been growing against New York's nuclear plans as Greens and consumer groups join forces. Dozens of environmental and consumer groups are challenging New York State's planned clean energy standard, saying there are cheaper ways of keeping the lights on while reducing the state's carbon footprint. The current plan calls for New York State to direct $965 million in additional revenue to three failing nuclear facilities in upstate New York, Fitzpatrick, Jenna, and Nine Mile. But the newly formed coalition of almost 100 members includes the New York Public Interest Research Group and many noted anti-nuclear groups as well. For whatever reason, a representative from Governor Andrew Cuomo's office called the coalition's arguments an absurd stance that would repeal a national model to fight climate change and replace it with more expensive dirty fuel and fracked gas. Apparently, This representative of Governor Cuomo has never heard of solar, wind, geothermal, and other forms of genuinely clean, green, sustainable energy production. But the nuclear industry has been pulling out all the stops in its moneyed, supported PR echo chamber machine, chief among them being, well, you'll hear it now, because... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. Dr. James Hansen, a pro-nuclear shill who calls himself a climate scientist, has recently spewed out a statement linking anti-nuclear groups with fossil fuel companies and tarring them with the same brush. When he calls anti-nuclear groups, quote, enemies of young people, nature, and all the species of creation, one initially thinks the man is out of his mind. But if you're familiar with Nazi-era propaganda tools as practiced by Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda, you'll recognize the strategy in an instant, and that is accuse the other side of that which you are guilty. So when he refers to nuclear reactors as, quote, the largest source of clean, put that in quotes, clean electricity, and refers to anti-nuclear groups as fringe groups, and urges officials in New York, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and federal courts to reject the pleas of those anti-nuclear fringe groups and move forward with plans to, I gag to say this, protect the environment for our grandchildren and clean air for all of us today, meaning with nukes, and warns that fear-mongering by decrepit, decrepit, we still move just fine, thank you, but he says decrepit anti-nuclear groups must not be allowed to determine our planet's future. Do you see what he just did there? He took all of the things that we rightfully call and label and name as the actions of the nuclear industry and throws them around on us. Again, the quote from Joseph Goebbels, accuse the other side of that which you are guilty. And here's the other piece to keep in mind. Goebbels also said, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. Which is how the atrocious lie that nuclear is anything other than the most toxic form of energy ever generated on this planet and that it is no way clean, green, or sustainable. Well, the waste is sustainable, but the energy certainly is not. And the waste is around for hundreds of thousands of years by the nuclear echo chamber going green, 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 green. It became a big enough lie that people, even legislators who deserve to know better and be smarter and more aware, have fallen for it. And that's why James Hansen 
you heinous piece of something that I cannot mention on a show that's going to be broadcast, you are definitely this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. I'm working to get some interviews on Indian Point and also the battle that's going on over New York State's planned clean energy standard and hope to have them to you on Nuclear Hot Seat within the next two weeks. In North St. Louis, the Missouri Department of Natural Resources has ordered Bridgeton Landfill LLC owner Republic Services to study the increased groundwater contamination detected at the site. Okay, we'll start with studying. Groundwater sampling reports that span October 2014 to April 2016 note increasing levels of hazardous substances that exceed federal levels. The Bridgeton landfill contains an underground smoldering fire that has now been burning for more than six years and sits approximately 600 feet away from World War II-era nuclear waste illegally buried under the Westlake Landfill Superfund site. Area resident Dawn Chapman, who runs the Just Moms STL activist group and is well known to listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat, is worried that the contamination could mix with radioactive waste. She said, depending on the direction the groundwater moves, even if it moves only one direction for a week or so in a year, if it's moving towards and interacting with the radiological material in the ground, then we have a big problem. That is an understatement. And now it's time for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Nuclear Reactor Duck <laughs> and Cover Report. At the Seabrook Station in New Hampshire, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says it will move forward with its review of the plant's license renewal process after accepting the owner's initial proposal for addressing concrete erosion in the facility. <laughs> At Cooper in Nebraska on October 23rd, a control room emergency ventilation fan was found inoperable due to elevated vibration, indicative of bearing failure. This condition is being reported as a single train safety system that is required to be operable during situations under which significant radioactive releases can be postulated. <laughs> and at the Electro Switch Manufacturing Facility in Weymouth, Massachusetts, starting on May 10th of this year, there were reports of defects and non-compliance in that it was determined on May 10th that ElectroSwitch does not have the capability to perform the evaluation to determine if a defect, which could create a substantial safety hazard, exists in their switches. The utilities and plants which were notified of ElectroSwitch's decision to end their quality assurance program include... Ameren Energy, Dominion Energy, Duke Energy, Energy Northwest, Energy Nuclear, including Waterford 3, Pilgrim and Indian Point, Excel Energy's Monticello Nuclear, MPR Associates for Florida Power and Light, Nebraska Public Power, meaning Cooper Nuclear, Nextera, Point Beach Nuclear, Excel Energy, which is Prairie Island Generation, Southern Power, which is Hatch, Southern Power at Vogel, TVA Watts Bar Nuclear, and Wolf Creek Nuclear. All of these facilities use switches that were built by ElectroSwitch and may be defective. And that's why we all have to duck <laughs> and cover. Over to Japan, where Dr. Kazuo Shimizu, chairman of the Fukushima Thyroid Examination Assessment Subcommittee, who is, among many credentials, a thyroid surgeon and former chair of the board of the Japanese Society of Thyroid Surgery, has submitted his resignation. As chairman of the Thyroid Examination Assessment Subcommittee, he does not personally agree with the interim report conclusion that, quote, it is unlikely that the effects of radiation, end quote, caused the high incidence of thyroid cancer found in the Fukushima prefecture, 
not agreeing with the drawn conclusions of the interim report, and as chairman not free to have a personal opinion nor to express it, Dr. Shimizu chose to resign. Within the Fukushima population, 380,000 children below the age of 18 at the time of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant accident in March of 2011 have been examined. 179 of them have so far been diagnosed with thyroid cancer or suspected thyroid cancer. Dr. Shimizu, now free to make any statement he likes, said that from his long clinical experience, such a high incidence of thyroid cancer is unnatural. He said that frequency is a fact which should not be explained nor discarded by just the quote. It is unlikely that the effects of radiation end quote, caused that high incidence conclusion. In the former Soviet Union, after the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear accident, thyroid cancer was frequent in children because of the radioactive iodine 131 that had been released. Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority has instructed Hokuriko Electric Power Company to further investigate and prevent a recurrence of flooding that short circuited the emergency lighting system at the Shika Nuclear Power Plant in Ishikawa Prefecture, which is in northwest Japan. 6.6 tons of rainwater entered the number two reactor building in late September. And also came close to drenching power batteries used for emergencies. NRA Chairman Shunichi Tanaka said on October 19th there was a possibility of losing an important safety function. The Fukushima nuclear disaster, which began in 2011, was caused in part by the loss of emergency power sources. Here's some numbnuts adjacent stories for you. The International Olympic Committee and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe baby have reportedly agreed that some of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic events should be held not in Tokyo but in Fukushima. Baseball and softball are considered the likeliest sports to have events in Fukushima, in part because the World Baseball Softball Confederation. Which succeeded in having the sport added to the Olympic schedule, held this year's under 15 baseball World Cup in Fukushima. That's under 15 years of age. What are they thinking? The IOC is also considering moving canoeing and rowing events to Tome in Miyagi Prefecture, 70 miles north of Fukushima. This is not just numbnuts; it's the Numbnuts Hall of Fame. And stunning in its numbnutsery, protests were held in Paris on Saturday, October 22nd, against Fukushima evacuees' forced return to their homes and the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. The protests were held by the French Green Ecology Party, Greenpeace France, and pardon my pronunciation, Réseau Sortir du Nucléaire. The protest took place in front of the Japanese embassy. Also in France, their nuclear safety authority has ordered the country's utility EDF to conduct checkups at five nuclear reactors ahead of their scheduled maintenance tests, citing potential weaknesses in critical parts manufactured by a Japanese company. All five reactors are using parts made by the Kita Kyushu-based firm Japan Casting and Forging Corporation. Which is now under scrutiny by Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority. The company manufactured reactor pressure vessels in 13 Japanese nuclear reactors, including the Sendai Number、no. One and Two reactors, which have both been restarted. While the reactor's operator, the Norwegian Institute for Energy Technology, announced today that the reactor is shut, the leak is contained. They also admitted that personnel at the plant had received a low dose of radiation. Remember, there is no such thing as an inconsequential dose of radiation because it all adds up; it is all cumulative under linear no threshold model. The leaked radioactive iodine has a radioactive decay half life of about eight days, but it takes ten half life cycles for it to go flat. So its effective radioactive life is eighty days. Or just a little shy of three months. In Ukraine, starting in 
That country is not going to pay Russia two hundred million dollars annually to remove spent nuclear fuel from the country. Instead, Ukraine will build its own spent nuclear fuel storage facility. Good luck with that. However, the storage site chosen is in the exclusion zone of Chernobyl. Construction of the new central used fuel storage facility is expected to start in March of 2017. The Taiwanese government has decided to abolish nuclear power generation by 2025 to meet the public's demand for a nuclear-free society. This, following their awareness of and response to the Fukushima nuclear disaster, Taiwan's executive yuan, the equivalent to the cabinet in Japan, approved revisions to the electricity business law, which aim to promote the private sector's participation in renewable energy products. President Tsai Ing-wen said, "Revising the law shows our determination to promote the move towards the abolition of nuclear power generation and change the ratio of electricity sources." Like Japan, Taiwan is hit by many earthquakes. And the three nuclear power plants currently in operation will reach their service lives of 40 years by 2025. The revised bill will clearly stipulate that operations of all the nuclear power plants will be suspended by that year. The government is looking to solar power and wind power as the pillars of renewable energies. And in China. Officers seized a gang that had smuggled more than 5,000 tons of seafood worth 230 million yuan, or 34.7 million U.S. dollars, with some of the products said to be from Japan's radiation-affected Fukushima. According to officials in Qingdao in eastern China, the company gathered seafood first in Japan's Hokkaido. And then transported it to Vietnam, where they changed the package and date of production to evade customs declaration and epidemic inspection. We'll have today's featured interviews in just a moment, but first, trick or treat! No, I'm not asking for sugar or additives. No blood sugar spike required. No sudden need to nap. The costume's on, and the bag is open for donations to help support the work of Nuclear Hot Seat. If you like your sweet and sour nuclear news collected from verifiable sources and presented hygienically wrapped in as much wit and mordant humor as possible, help us keep the show going and growing. It's a scary thought to be without it, so don't let the nuclear goblins get you. Just go to nuclearhotseat.com and click on the big red donate button. You can use your PayPal account. Debit card or credit card, and if you prefer to donate by check, we can make arrangements for that too. Be this a one-time bribe to keep the nuclear demons from your door, or a monthly donation to make certain they stay away. Whatever you can do to help support the work of Nuclear Hot Seat, you have my gratitude. By way of introducing this week's first featured interview. I must share with you a nuclear hot seat tradition. One <clears> hundred <throat> nuclear reactors still on. One hundred nukes still on. Take one down. Fort Calhoun is now gone, except for all that radioactive waste. Still, ninety-nine nuclear reactors still on. And that's what this interview is about. Laverne Trayan is a longtime activist in Nebraska, fighting on a range of energy issues. Most specifically, against the Fort Calhoun nuclear generating station, we spoke on Monday, October twenty-four, twenty sixteen, and the timing, as you will hear, was most significant. Laverne Trayan, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat on this most joyous of mornings. Thank you. It is a great day. As we're speaking, how long has the Fort Calhoun nuclear power station been shut down? Well, if all went well, about 45 minutes now. Right at 1:30, I picked up my girl and met with her, and we gave a big smooch and wished each other a happy nuclear-free future. And I looked around and noticed that none of the lights blinked, and none of the lights turned off. So all the fear mongers who said for 30 years that. You can't do without it. It would have to go with no lights. 
Well, guess what? They're all wrong. <laughs> how long have you been working on this issue, and how does it feel to finally get to this kind of a landmark? Well, late 80s is when I got involved. The, you know, the Great Peace March came through Omaha. I think it's 86. And, you know, I ran for OPPD in 92 when I was 30 and, you know, just been at it the whole time, just been, you know, anti-nuclear, anti-coal, pro-renewable, pro-efficiency. If you look at the articles from back then, it's the exact same articles as of today. We're just saying the same thing. Could we insulate people's homes and could we give them a smart grid? And Yeah, the smart grid popped up since, you know, the 80s, <laughs> so that's nice. What is the official line that is being put forth as to why Fort Calhoun is finally being shut down? Well, they say it's because it costs $73, I believe, a kilowatt, and it's, you know, you can buy energy offline for 20 So it just got too expensive to run. And it's always been too expensive. It was double the amount of money to, to build it as they projected. $70 million, it was $180 million when they built the thing. Just got done spending three hundred million on fixing bolts that were too short, and I know the real reason is because they could not fix a shelf. The cooling shelf, the shelf that holds the cooling equipment, is holding more weight than it's rated for, and it has been for years. And when the NRC took it over in the 2011 to 2013, 14 period. Hundreds of items, hundreds, as the World Herald put it this morning, hundreds of items were on a laundry list. Two small bolts in the concrete holding equipment down. Cooling shelves that are underrated for the weight that they're holding. So ultimately, to fix that shelf, they would have had to put a pillar through the entire plant down into the bedrock. And there was no way that that would ever be cost-effective or even doable. So it was right about now that they were going to have to explain to the NRC if they're going to continue to operate until the end of their current licensing, how are they going to fix that? And so they came up with, oh, it's too expensive to run the place. And maybe that $73 figure is, you know, calculated, that shelf is calculated in there or whatever. They don't break it out like that. It sounds like they probably rigged the numbers to sound as devastatingly bad as possible so that they would have an excuse to shut it down. Quite frankly, I don't care what excuse they have as long as it's shut down. Because I can recall right when I was getting started with nuclear hot seat in 2011, you had the flooding off the Missouri River that surrounded that facility. And it was only an 8-inch inflatable berm that protected it from the rising waters. And at one point, the berm deflated when a backhoe was back into it and punctured it. Why was the reactor not shut down then when it would have been an obvious thing to do? Well, because they were currently refueling. When that flood hit, they had had it shut down, and they were refueling it. And then when the flood came in, they kind of halted the refueling process because the flood was causing too many trouble. And then when the 18-month-old six, uh, part of the $200 million up rate that they were going through uh, in 2007 to 2011, they um, fixed a switch, a main switch that turns on and off the plant. And instead of replacing the whole box, they modified it, and then it got hot and burst into flames, and they got locked out of their control room. So during the flood, that 18th month old fix burst into flames. Then the NRC comes in, and then the NRC walks around and finds their stick to measure how high the river was wasn't long enough to reach the river if we were in drought season. And we have more drought seasons than we have wet seasons. So when the water in the river goes down, they couldn't even measure if it would be low enough to fire up the pumps or to do whatever to, to continue having water on the plant. I mean, just simple. I think it's funny now, you know, that, that, that their measuring streak wasn't long enough. But it was just emblematic of all the hundreds and hundreds of things that the NRC found wrong with that plant. I mean, it sits on karst formations. There's two faults underneath it. We learned all of this through the NRC taking it over. You know, all this information was put out. So, of course, their reason for shutting it down is not safety. It's not protecting people and the environment. It's the money. 
Yeah, of course. You know, they even have to hire Exelon to run the place because I guess we just couldn't hire anybody who knew how to run the place. And you're just like, none of that seems to bother anybody. Oh, oh, it cost 73 bucks. Okay, you're right. We're done. Well, my father didn't quit smoking until they were a dollar a pack. There was a quote on Facebook today from Bob Alvarez, who's been a national leader, worked in the White House as an advisor on energy issues, and he has been quite a profound and meaningful voice within our community for decades now. And he posted on Facebook earlier today, and this is in regards to Fort Calhoun, closed nuclear power plants become de facto radioactive waste management operations storing concentrations of long-lived radionuclides that dwarf those generated by the country's nuclear weapons program. So with Fort Calhoun transitioning into a radioactive waste management operation, what changes do you see happening in the group that has been protesting so long and so hard? I have already done extensive research on the decommissioning and on the long-term management Really exciting news. The Department of Energy has granted the University of Nebraska at Lincoln Engineering Department money to do the research on the radiation effects on concrete, which will then, you know, we'll start to learn more about how long it takes, what kind of mixtures we're going to have to mix kind of concrete for that long-term storage. And we can't really think of long-term storage or permanent storage. It's all, you know, like you said, managed storage. The idea is, is every 100 years you're going to have to switch that out into a new container. They don't have sensors that last over 100 years that could continue to sense if there is a leak or not. The gap between the, the inside tube and the concrete, there's two gaps in there that has gas in them, and if that gas changes, then it triggers the switch, and that means you know, they have a leak or a problem. So right now they're doing research about how do you know if a sensor is sending you the information, what kind of safeguards do you have in place to know if that sensor is sending you the proper information. So that, you know, just the sensors alone over the thousands of years, that's going to have to sit there and cool. OPPD has to change their mind. OPPD is currently operating on the idea that they can return the property to green space because that's what their original licensing was. And so they believe that the federal government's going to remove that waste and they aren't going to have to deal with it long term. And I'm the only one that's been standing up saying, hey, guys, you know, it's going to be a long term management. You need to plan for 100 year installments. You know, every 100 years being able to transfer the waste into new tubes with new sensors and the like. And the storage units have to be so many feet apart so a bomb can't get them all and cause the trouble. And, just all the other issues that go with it. But, yeah, I've been doing extensive research. Locally here, they're doing the research on the concrete, which is exciting. I think if OPB does the right thing, you know, follows the lead, they could get it to a site that's safe for long-term storage. One can only hope. And, of course, with the dry casks that you're talking about, there are varying qualities and various standards of them. You're talking about those that have sensors in them that can be read and feed information to the outside. I don't know if that is part of the kinds of dry tasks that are being proposed here in Southern California for San Onofre. Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety is, of course, the local and one of the brighter lights in terms of researching the dry tasks and finding out what the dangers are, where the weaknesses are, and continually bringing them up. Have you been in contact with her to explore various aspects of the storage that's being proposed? No, I haven't. The only thing I've done is read the UCLA research projects that have been testing concrete, and it's not inert. It does break down. For years, all the other concrete casts were, you know, they, they were building them in the belief that concrete was inert. You know, it wouldn't be a problem. But there are concrete mixtures that are in there, and we just need to find out which those are, and that's the kinds of studies that are going on now here at Omaha and in UCLA. UCLA also got a grant to do the same work. So I'm keeping an eye on those studies there because that's going to be the pertinent information. And the the next step for these guys over here is the, the, the pool, the cooling pool. Cooling pools were a reset from their original configuration to store more rods in it than they were originally configured for. Well, if you lose water, they'll burst in the flames. So they need to immediately 
reconfigure the pool back to original configuration. So if they do leave the pool there for 50 or 60 years, because they technically can under their new arrangements, then if the pool loses water sometimes over the next 50 years, they would be able to have a chance not to just explode. So that seems to be important to me. And it just seems important to get rid of the cooling pool and get everything in dry cast as soon as possible. So I, I could, you know, they could do it in 10 years very easily. But they said no to that because it's too much money up front. It's always the money when it comes to nuclear, not anything else. I do strongly urge you to get in touch with Donna Gilmore, and I'll, after the interview, I'll give you that information because she's somebody who, as a novice, has done so much research that she discovered certain aspects about high burn-up fuel, and she actually has been invited to and spoke at the NRC to their engineers to let them know what she has found out. I think it, it would be very important for you to speak. Now I have a really important question to ask. Where's the party? What are you and the group doing to celebrate this monumental shift in the nuclear situation in and around your area of the country? Well, like I said, at one thirty today I met with my uh, girlfriend, and I had a shot of whiskey and kissed her on the lips, and that was my celebration. But the rest of the people, you know, it's hard to get people together. They all work different days, different hours, different reasons. It's very difficult to get people together. Everybody's saying stuff on Facebook and sending messages, I think, more than anything. Well, I hope you can get people together. In the past, Nuclear Hot Seat's been able to cover the shutdown of Vermont Yankee and the shutdown of Santa Ana Friday by talking to people at the various parties that were there. And it was quite a joyous celebration. For whatever reasons that have been given by the power company, I can only wish you and the uh, congratulations on this great success, but don't break up the group yet because now the issues shift into this next dynamic. Right. Long-term stories. It's exactly right. It never ends. It's for the next 100,000 years. We've already set our table. We just have to sit and eat. And boy, that's an awful long time that we have to sit at that table for an awfully small and really expensive meal. That's exactly right. Laverne, Triton, congratulations again to you and the entire group that's been fighting it out there in Nebraska. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time during this celebration day to speak with the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. That was longtime energy activist Laverne Trayan on this past Monday's final closure of the Fort Calhoun Nuclear Generating Station near Omaha, Nebraska. Note that Bob Alvarez, who is referenced in this interview, served as Senior Policy Advisor to the Energy Department's Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment from 1993 to 1999. Now for interview number two, the ongoing saga of the push to close down the Pilgrim Nuclear Generating Station in Massachusetts. Diane Turco of Cape Downwinders on Cape Cod has been a passionate, outspoken activist working to get the Pilgrim Nuclear Generating Station closed for more years than anyone wants to consider. The facility is located near Boston and Cape Cod, And should an accident happen there, evacuation from Cape Cod is simply not possible. Diane was arrested following a sit-in in in Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker's office in early September, an event featured on Nuclear Hot Seat number 273 on September 13. Now she returns to us with an update on last week's Citizens Speak Out at the Massachusetts State House and tells us where pressure needs to be placed to help shut Pilgrim now. Diane Turco, it is always a pleasure to have you as my guest on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you very much for having me again. Let's start out with a sense of what the current issues are that are surrounding the Pilgrim nuclear power plant. We know about the technical problems, but these are more dealing with government and how Massachusetts itself is responding to this issue. As we all know, Pilgrim Nuclear is in its second year as one of the worst operating reactors in the country. And just recently, on September 6th, they had yet another scram. And three days later, when they were going to restart, Entity was restarting Pilgrim, there was another malfunction. 
And after that, there was a hydrogen buildup in the um, turbine building that had to be released. And beyond that, when Entergy filed their report with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they falsified the record stating they had notified the um, fire chief in Plymouth when they never had done that. So that just recently, there's a lot going on there. Even though Entergy said they're closing in 2019, it is more of a danger today because they are not putting any effort into repairing any of the faulty equipment, and we see that they have applied for an extension to 2019 of their Fukushima safety upgrades. We're talking about the Mark 1 boiling water reactor. And these are, we're talking about those hardened vents that should have been in place years ago. Anyways, our state congressional delegation, Senator Markey, Senator Warren, and the entire congressional delegation wrote a letter to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission asking them to deny Entergy's application for an extension on this Fukushima fix. And we thank them for understanding that we are in danger. However, they did say that if the Nuclear Regulatory Commission approves this extension, they concluded that, quote, it will be unjustifiably exposing Massachusetts communities to danger. So they are clearly expressing the understanding of this imminent threat to our communities. However, those vents aren't in there right now. So what our congressional delegation should be saying is, shut Pilgrim now. We recognize that our communities are in danger. However, they have fallen short of doing that. So we look to our governor who is our chief safety officer. Governor Baker has been our target for addressing this issue. We have sent him letters. We have met with his staff. They take notes. We'll get back to you, and we are not getting anything back from him. So to get the attention of the governor and hopefully the media and the rest of the state and the people, tell us about the action that was put together, the speak out that was done last Thursday, October 20th, at the Massachusetts State House. We gathered folks from around the community. We had a state senator, Dan Wolf, who has been a champion to shut down Pilgrim from day one, along with State Representative Sarah Peake, who also has been a champion to close Pilgrim immediately. Uh, we had candidates who are running for office on the Cape, Julian Sayre, who's running for the Cape and Island State Senate, and Matt Patrick, who's running for the Barnesville Third District. They, too, support the immediate closure of Pilgrim. We had Emily Norton, who is the Massachusetts chapter, Sierra Club director, Ed DeWitt, who is the Association to Preserve Cape Cod Executive Director, Dr. Richard Clapp, Professor Emeritus of Environmental Health, Reverend Dr. Michelle Walsh, UU Mass Action. We had two students from uh, Nassau High School come to speak for their generation, Claire Lonsdale and Kyle Gilmore. And we also had Deb Katz, Executive Director of the Citizens Awareness Network. Each one of these folks stood up at the State House and spoke for the immediate closure of Pilgrim. It was a great citizen's action to come to the People's House and demand that Pilgrim close immediately. The trail of the public trust is seriously challenged by this action that our governor is not taking. What was the intention? What did you want to have happen as a result of this speak out? And what has been the response thus far? We had a speaker a year ago, too. We just feel it's very important as citizens that we continue to speak out and try and gather the community together to join us. Betrayal of public trust seriously challenges our democratic values, and this is what is happening. Our elected officials are supposed to be for providing for public safety, and they are not doing so. So it is time to confront a government that is failing the people. So we will confront Governor Baker and demand that he follow his mandate to uphold public health and safety. What kind of coverage did you receive from the media as a result of the speak out? Well, the State House News covered the story. I think it was on WBUR. I'm not sure. We didn't get much coverage in the regular newspapers or the TV, which I find very interesting. Last year we had Channel 5, the Boston Station, um, and other news outlets. So we had less coverage, but it was in the State House News, and that was what was important is that we want the legislators at the State House to understand that we are serious, and this is a serious threat to the whole region, not just Cape Cod. That's what Boston needs to understand. When I stand at the State House, I'm as far away from Pilgrim as I am when I am home in Harwich, Massachusetts. And all of Cape Cod has potassium iodide pills because the state recognizes that we are going to be exposed. Have you heard anything from Governor Baker's office or from any of the legislators who signed that letter since the speak out? No, we have not, no. Like I said, we have delivered many letters to the governor and his staff takes notes, say they'll get back to us, and then they don't. I know that several weeks ago, 
there were three activists arrested for sitting in at the governor's office after having delivered yet another letter. Yes. I believe you were one of them. Yes. yes. And there were two others. What has happened since that time? Doug Long from Orleans and Mary Connison from Chatham were with me, and there were nine other people who were involved in the sit-in. We went to deliver another letter to the governor to demand that he uphold his public duty. And we met with the staff again, and they took notes again, and then they said, we'll get back to you. And we said, we'll wait until the governor responds. And he said, well, we'll, we'll get back to you. And we said, well, we're not leaving until the governor responds. So um, we stayed in the office, and at 7.30, when the state house was closed and all the lights were out and no one was around, we were arrested. Interesting, we had gone up to the state house news to let them know that we were going to be in the office and gave them all of our documents. And they came down to see us, and the staff told them that it was okay, we were in the room, and that not a big deal, so they left. The good thing, though, is even though we didn't get press coverage of that, what happened was the Boston Globe was on it, and they came out with an editorial three days later that said it's too risky to wait for Pilgrim plants to shut down, and they're calling for an early shutdown. So that was a powerful statement, and really I think it's changing the paradigm up at the State House because the Boston Globe has come out to say that Pilgrim is unsafe. What's next for Cape Downwinders and all this diligent work that seems so necessary in shutting down a nuclear facility that is well known to be in really bad shape and not Mm -hmm. being maintained with all the other problems that you have cited. What are you doing next that you can talk about? Well, we're trying to build up the public pressure on the government, again, to dismiss the dangers that exposes a phenomenal failure of government. So we have a civic obligation to be outraged. So what we're doing now is reaching out to faith communities and asking them to join us up at the State House at least once a month for actions, delivering letters, having speak-outs, but to keep our voices loud and clear in that state house that Pilgrim needs to be shut now. What can we do as listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat to support the work that you're doing? Well, I think one great thing is make a phone call to the governor's office. I have done that. Yes. Yes, she took my notes. She didn't say she'd get back to me, but she took my notes. Yes, yes. So we're asking people to continue to call the governor's office to write to you, legislators, and demand that Pilgrim be closed. They know how dangerous it is. When our senators and congressmen say, don't allow entity to have this extension because unjustifiably Massachusetts communities will be in danger, clearly shows they understand we are in danger right now. So let's, they need to be speaking up to the truth of the matter and, and call for the immediate closure. As we've been saying, to keep Pilgrim open to protect Entergy's bottom line rather than health and safety is a moral and dangerous. To ignore the documented dangers is irresponsible, and to discount the public's pleas is undemocratic. So we need to continue to stand strong together and speak louder until they take action and demand that Pilgrim be closed. It is my strongest wish that having just spoken with one of the activists involved with the shutdown of Fort Calhoun in Nebraska, that Mm -hmm. the next time there's a nuclear reactor that shut down, it's Pilgrim, and we get to have that interview real soon. Oh, that would be wonderful, wonderful. And we have a great team out here and lots of people working on it, so we're feeling that moving up to Boston is going to be a really strong, powerful action. Every success to you, and for whatever happens, I'm happy to report it on Nuclear Hot Seat. And for now, Diane Turco, Thanks again so much for keeping us up to date on all things Pilgrim. Thank you very much. Cape Downwinder, Diane Turco. To phone Massachusetts Governor Baker's office, you can call 617-725-4005. And don't worry if you didn't write it down just now. We will also have the phone number up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode number 279. By the way, the citizen protesters who went to the Massachusetts State House were told in advance that they were not allowed to have any signs, no protest signs whatsoever. So they went out and got a bunch of t-shirts printed up. Can't take the t-shirts away, that would be indecency. Strange that that would be indecent, but a nuclear reactor that's in such bad shape as Pilgrim is not. In any event, 
The picture on the website does show them sitting there with their yellow T-shirts blaring out the message. You couldn't miss it. Great move. Activist shout out. I want to acknowledge a group that is doing remarkable and important work in Fukushima. The Mother's Radiation Lab and Clinic in Iwaki, Fukushima, is a radiation measuring center organized and run by independent citizens. They pulled this together after, in their words, they were lied to, betrayed, and abandoned by the Japanese government. The Mother's Radiation Lab in Fukushima, which I believe is referred to as Tarachine, was founded in 2011. As they write on their website, Our mission is to protect our children from the invisible threat, radiation. Our solution is to measure this radiation and make it visible. Local parents bring their vegetables, vacuum cleaner dust, sand from the kindergarten sand pit, or soil from the school playground to our lab for testing. We measure anything and everything. Our radiation lab is the only citizen-run lab that measures not just cesium-134 and 137, but also strontium-90 and tritium, which require high-level expertise. The English-language website is up, and we will have a link to it on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 279. Here's today's final thought, or thoughts because I have two of them. The first is in regard to Twitter training, which I started talking about last week, and the need for all of us to really ramp up our skills on this important social media platform. So my question to you is, what's your hashtag? If you have an event coming up, consistent use of a hashtag allows the media to track Twitter posts And if they see enough of them, determine if something is trending. That's important because these media organizations all have computer programs to trace and then contact those people who post almost immediately after their tweet comes up. It's both exciting and scary. But it's how the media is finding stories and finding sources on site and involved to interview. So if you have an event or an action coming up, you have to determine your hashtag in advance, get it out to your network, and have everyone use it consistently. If I can take this one step further, there are tricks to coming up with a memorable hashtag. You have to make certain that it is clear, short, and includes keywords as well as active command verbs. It's not as hard as I just made it sound. For example, post about Pilgrim could use the hashtag shut Pilgrim now. What makes that good is that it is relatively short. Each of the words is easy to understand. It has an active command verb at the start, shut. It has a keyword, Pilgrim, and a time frame, now. Shut Pilgrim now with a little hashtag in front. Every time you post anything dealing with Pilgrim, use that hashtag. Twitter, you can use it on Facebook too. You never know where this stuff is going to get picked up. Now, Indian Point seems to be using the hashtag Stop Cuomo Tax. But that could be confusing if people don't know what tax is being referred to. A different one to consider would be Stop Cuomo Energy Tax or Stop Cuomo Nuke Tax. What that gives us is, again, an active command verb, stop, a name identifier, which can work as a keyword, Cuomo, an adjective on the kind of tax, either nuke or nuclear, or probably in this case energy might be better. Whatever is decided, choose one and then use it all the time, every time you post on this subject. In the coming weeks, I will explain to you how to plan and execute 
a massive tweet dump in conjunction with your planned actions. Remember, this is the way the media scans for hot stories. So if we are to make ourselves a hot story, I don't know, there's a pun in there somewhere, but I don't feel like going for it. If you want to get yourself on the media's radar, you've got to start using hashtags and Twitter if we are to have any hope of obtaining the coverage that we need. Now here's my second final thought, my final final thought, and that is that it's Halloween, scary time of the year, especially with the election just around the corner. But you know something? Nuclear is scarier than Halloween, 24-7-365. So for this Halloween, I've decided to dress up as radiation. That's right. I'm going to go out and be everywhere, but I'll be invisible. So, of course, you won't know exactly where I am or exactly what I'm doing, but trust me, while you won't be able to see me, hear me, smell me, I hope not, taste me or touch me, I'll be there. Actually, that's just a metaphor, because in truth, I'll probably just be staying home in order to keep away from the sugar-hyped little kids going nutso everywhere I look in my neighborhood. I'll be watching a non-scary DVD, probably something black and white and possibly musical. But then again, you never know. Remember, radiation is invisible. And by dressing up as radiation, I could be anywhere, at any time. <laughs> this has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, October 25th, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from miningawareness.wordpress.com, deunrenard.wordpress.com, omaha.com, kmtv.com, npr.org, statehousenews.com, asahi.com, utilitydive.com, environmentalprogress.org, stlpublicradio.org, nh1.com, wtvy.com, rviewjournal.com, insidethegames.biz, irishexaminer.com, forbes.com, english.kyotonews.jp, rt.com, china.org.cn, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the smart, big-hearted, compassionate souls in the anti-nuclear movement all over the world who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, and you're invited to join us, like us, share our posts with your family and friends, and post your own information, too, because without that Facebook equivalent of the old teletypes in newsrooms, it would be hard to get the range of information that I get. And I am dependent on so many of you for sending the verifiable news links to me so that I can scope them out and make certain that I've got them covered on this program. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, and recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that the cure for global warming is not nuclear winter. And now that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call, don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb. <laughs>